Joining me now, first class father, NFL Hall of Famer, Larry Zonka. Welcome to First Class Fatherhood. <laughs> it's good to be here with you. I don't know if I qualify myself as first class father or not. I, I'd have to talk to a couple sons, a couple grandchildren, and a couple great grandchildren if I could find that out. Well, you made the show here. That's what that's what we're calling you for now. So let's start with that. How many kids do you have? How old are they? Oh, I've got two sons that are grown and um, <laughs> a daughter that's grown. I've got uh, grandchildren that are grown. I've got five grandchildren and five great grandchildren. So to run through all the names and dates, we're going to be here to take up the whole show. But, you know, I started at a very young age at 19. My first son was born in uh, 66, in 1966. So, um, they're up there. They're grandparents themselves now. So it's been a it's been a, an ongoing thing. It seems like about every 15 years or so, there's a there's a new we, we have new gifts in the family. <laughs> and uh, we, we have a great uh, what, what that makes for is great holidays. Occasionally, we have a place here in Florida. We have a place in North Carolina. We're very fortunate. And uh, we get to see them that way. I had a place in Alaska for a long time, but I got rid of it because I couldn't see my grandchildren and my great grandchildren because their schedules were so different. You know, kids, unlike when we were kids or when I was a kid, you didn't have much to do in the summertime or the, you know, vacation time from school. But today's kids are busy all the time. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. They can play one particular sport. They can play it all year long. There's plenty of different leagues and travel leagues and all kinds of stuff like that. No doubt about that. So take take me back to the beginning of it, if you could, then, Larry, when you first became a father. About about how old were you when you first became a dad? Where were you at in your NFL career or your football career? And how did that experience change your perspective on life? I was a sophomore at Syracuse University. And uh, I was probably 19 years old or 20, just turning 20. And uh, when my first son, uh, Doug, was born, our first child, Doug, was born. And uh, I was, uh, you know, there were no cell phones, none of that communication. I was working a night job to support an off-campus apartment where we were living. And I was playing football at Syracuse and, of course, attending the university. So I had a very busy schedule. And uh, unfortunately, I was not able to be there at the pr at the moment that he was born, but I was there just minutes afterwards but uh that's something i've I, it always bothered me that i wasn't able to get back first baby we weren't sure about how that was going to work and back then all they could do was call you on a hard phone a hard line and i was a night watchman at a place and it was uh that's yeah, something that you can tell it's always bothered me because i walked in and my son had just been born five minutes before and uh that was uh something that always bothered me but uh then I was with Miami a few years later, 1968, my second son was born, 1971, my daughter, Lori, was born. And uh, so then, you know, the beat goes on. And, and, and what are, uh, obviously, you had them right at the beginning of your NFL career. There. What, what are some of the challenges, especially back then, uh, maybe where today the NFL has so many different things to help guys that are having kids. They have a lot of things at the facility. They do a lot of different uh, stuff. What what were some of the challenges of being a father uh, while, you know, having to perform at such a high level in the NFL? Scheduling more than anything. Uh, my sons were very young. Uh, obviously, I just uh, was a sophomore at Syracuse. But so my oldest son, Doug, was just uh, – two or three years old when I started with uh, Miami. And then in 1970, they were both just little guys. Uh, I would take them down to uh, the day after the game kind of thing where I go down to the locker room and uh, coach Shula had a great big dog <laughs> or one of the coaches had a great big dog that would run around in the locker room day after the game. Everyone had to come in and check in. You had the day off of course, but you, if you were injured in the game and the way I played football, I was usually beat up pretty good after a game. So, uh, or walking softly, let's put it that way. And uh, I would go down to see the trainers at the locker room. And the coaches, of course, would always be there. And uh, some of the coaches, it's kind of a relaxed day, the day after the game. And I would take uh, the boys with me. And uh, I was in on the training table one time, and my older son, eldest son, came riding this giant dog in. <laughs> he was actually on the dog's back. That's how big this—I don't know—it was like a Saint Bernard kind of dog. And uh, 
was racing around the locker room and coach Schiller goes, well, that, that nut didn't fall very far from the tree. did it?" <laughs> <laughs> when my son passed him on the dog racing into the uh, trading room, he kind of tickled him. He, Schuler was a very uh, family oriented guy, uh, had a large family and uh, was very into that. The kids would be there. His sons and daughters would be around the facility very often. And as a result of that, uh, it was a pretty warm place, particularly the day after the game. Yeah, I would imagine that has to be such a, a an odd off switch to be able to play the game at such a physical, intense level, and then to be the father, the family man on the side. I guess that 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 that's a big dichotomy for especially uh, guys that played the game as physically as you did. Uh, but I, w- I would say this, like I, I one of the things I talk about on this show a lot, Larry, is, is the fatherless crisis that we have going on in our country where we have so many kids growing up without a father or a father figure in their mm-hmm. life. And it's mm-hmm. really having a devastating effect on our society. And one of the places where the kids do find that father figure, it could be through sports, through a coach. A lot of them could find it in a teacher and it can really turn their lives around. And uh, you know, obviously, when they find it in the street, is where everything goes south. But did you did, was uh, Coach Shula like that with some of the guys on the team? Did you have uh, players on that Dolphin team that came from a background that didn't have a father growing up or a bad relationship with the father growing up, and Coach Shula took over that role? Was he like that as, as a coach? I think there was a degree of that. Certainly, Bob Greasy's uh, uh, grew up uh, with not uh, not having a father there very very long. I think he he uh, passed on early. And Bob was uh, wasn't fatherless. He had other people around, but there, you know, I think a coach figure turns into a kind of a father figure, but uh, a boss figure at the same time. You know, he has to set the discipline train. But I think you find people throughout your life. I think you take any pro ball player, any successful actor, anyone that's successful in anything, you'll find where they've had pivotal people that have inter- in, intervened in their lives at different times that influenced them. In my case, I had a junior high principal, a fellow named Mr. Saulus, who was a, an old retired football coach, but he was also our science teacher in seventh and eighth grade, and he was the junior high principal. But he was kind of a father figure because he he recognized that I was a kid that was getting in a lot of trouble. So I was in his office very often. But he took uh, he saw me playing on the playground and catching a football and running around and just things kids do at recess. And he steered me towards football. And when I got in discipline problems at juvenile court and was a sentence to was sentenced to, <laughs> to to go to him because the juvenile court recognized him as a good good father figure authority type figure i he he started steering me towards football and without that without that interaction between he and i at that point in my life i had become i didn't know anything about football went out for it quit after a week and wasn't going to be that anymore as a farm kid in ohio i had plenty else to do and if i have to walk home after practice and so on i didn't really care about it but after he taught me what it was all about by writing out reports on different football books that he pointed out to me because I was serving a sentence via the judge. I got in some trouble with a bicycle that got taken and I got blamed for it. I didn't actually, well, I won't even get into all that, but nevertheless, <laughs> I was assigned to him. And as part of his uh, his uh, demand for me was to read these books and give me a, give him a report about football. And then later on, it, it once I understood football, I went back out for it the next year and did very well at it because I understood what was going on. I knew all the positions, knew what to expect. I knew what was expected of you if you played at that particular position, offense or defense. See, that was the beginning. But that came from a guy that wasn't he wasn't necessarily certainly wasn't any blood relative of mine or anything. I inherited him like the whole junior high did. But what a great, great father figure he filled there, you know, that, uh, uh, well, it just made a big difference in my life. And it's not always just your father. I, there's other people in the community. What you just alluded to is exactly right. Sometimes you find that father figure or parent figure, and it's not necessarily a blood relative or anything, but it's someone that steers you onto the right path and says, look, you, you know, there's a definite line between right and wrong, and you're kind of hedging back and forth here. Let's go over to sports here. Here's the rules. You got to, you know, you're either in bounds or you're out of bounds. Right now, over here, you're getting out of bounds. Come over here and play in sports and see if you can stay in bounds. 
he presented it as a challenge. See, that, that little moment there, when I was inducted into the Hall of Fame in 1987, I had him there and I had him stand up. I know, not to suggest that my father wasn't just as important in different aspects of my life. Certainly he was. But at that bunch juncture in my life where I made that turn from right and wrong and separating the two, the fine line and not, not confusing it and saying, well, I'm just a little bit over. I didn't really steal the bicycle. I just borrowed it. Bullshit. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you got to draw the line. So that little bit of extra discipline I learned from Mr. Solis, and that's why I had him there at the Hall of Fame. Made a big difference. I can only imagine what he must have felt seeing you there in the Hall of Fame, Super Bowl MVP, legendary NFL player from that, from seeing you as a kid on the playground to where you were. That had to be tremendous for him. I can only imagine. And, and you allude to there, you got yourself into some trouble. Uh, I know you talk about that in your book. I'm going to get into the book in just a, in, in just a minute here. Uh, but I wanted to ask you about, uh, as far as being a father, what type of disciplinarian uh, were you as a dad with the kids growing up? And is that different than the discipline style you grew up with? Well, fortunately, I had a little more time in my life. We didn't have to use the stick with my father. You know, my father's uh, discipline in the, in the 50s was a little more direct. You know, when you finally got in enough trouble that he took time off to talk to you about it, it wasn't much talk. There was a little action. But hopefully that's changing to where there's more interaction and more uh, brain connection rather than just the, the hard line discipline. I think uh, having people involved in your life and having the time to be involved in a child's life is very important uh, today. And from the time I was a boy to the time my sons were growing up, the 20 year period that passed there from 46 to 66 and 66 to 76, uh, when my kids were growing up and just young fellows, it was nice to be able to spend a little quality time here and there with them to try to guide them. You know, you, you point them towards honesty, you, you point them towards integrity, you point them towards the things that you aspire to be and show them that you, no one's perfect, but you try to be these things and you try to go on your word. And that's uh, where Mr. Solis back in years ago steered me. And that's where I tried to steer them. Now, how effective that is and how they translate it, that's the father-son relationship. And some, you know, one son translated one way, another son, the other son translated another. And my daughter, yet a third boy. But the, the, the point of it is, is to have an interest. And once they know that you have that interest, then they come to you, perhaps not for advice, but for uh, guidance a little bit, maybe which way to turn. And I think that uh, that's... That's caring, and that's uh, discipline without necessarily uh, employing uh, any kind of physical aspect to it. You you try to reason uh, from the time they're young and make it make it so it makes sense the way you want to present it. Yeah, well said, and I would say too, it's almost like uh, head coaches in the NFL as far as being your parents. You you get all the blame when there's a loss, when there's a failure, but you don't get much of the credit when there's the success. But uh, it's and and each kid has to be disciplined in a different way. I got four of them. And it couldn't be uh, more for different individuals that require different styles of discipline. So uh, it's it's definitely tricky. And I wanted to say here, uh, head on your memoir, Larry Zonka. What what was uh, walk me through just a bit of uh, the process of here for you uh, writing the book? What was the genesis of this? Had this come about that you were going to decide to write the memoir? And what were some of the challenge? Was there was there difficulty in, in some remembrance? Some of it was there some of the stuff tough to get through? And maybe some of the highlights. I've been seventy six year, years living a life. I've been 50 years trying to put the memoir together from <laughs> the time I entered the NFL, particularly the childhood. I had a very unusual childhood, and I spent a lot of time in the book going back and talking about that. Now, I, I had a dream. I just wanted to get to Alaska, and it was a major thing in my life, but it seemed like every time I made a right turn, it was away from Alaska instead of getting to Alaska. I covered it in the book. You're familiar with it. But it, those things happen, and but... As you live your life, you you mark moments, you know, when your children are born, the first house, the first time you build a house instead of just buying a house. All those things are milestones that we're very fortunate in our society. We get to, to live and enjoy, hopefully enjoy. And it's nice to remember little parts of it here and there. But, uh, and I'd be, I'd be at a great loss if I didn't tell you, my wife, Audrey, if she was the motivating factor in this thing, she, you know, I'd tell stories, we get together with the kids and, and uh, 
my sons, my grandsons, and, and great grandsons, great granddaughter. And I tell them stories about when I was a kid camping out and stuff. And that's why they like to camp out so much and different things. And Audrey would say, you got to keep those stories. We got to put that down and put it in a book someday. And I'm like, oh, you and that book, you know, you're always talking. Well, finally, at 75 years old, she said, guess what, grandpa, great grandpa, it's time. So let's do it. <laughs> well, saying you're going to do it and doing it, as you well know, is uh, is two different things. But we were very fortunate. We got with the right publishing people and uh, we got it down, got it written, went back through it. Tough thing about writing a book is when you live your life for 75 years and you're writing about it, particularly in my life where I was fortunate enough to be around a lot of a lot of very great sports figures and influential people. Uh, it's tough to talk about all of them in the book. The book turns into the encyclopedia, uh, the set of encyclopedias. It's crazy. So you got to hone that down and just touch on it. But I wanted to put in all the flavor of growing up in the country, of playing football in New York City, of being out in the outback in Alaska and how truly remote that still is there. And I wanted to convey that to people. And I believe with Audrey's help, we got that done. I'm very pleased with the way the book came out and we're getting some great reviews and it's, uh, it's been a very rewarding experience. Yeah, it definitely is so cool for the fans, but what a gift for your family to have forever, to have this memoir of your life and, and your story and your words. So uh, so cool for you to do that. And uh, what would you say has been uh, the transition for you, becoming a grandfather, becoming a, a great-grandfather here? What has that been like for you? And, uh, and uh, it, it, how is it different from you being a dad? Being a dad, you don't stop and think about the long-distance future. You react right at the moment. When you're a grandfather... You don't have to react right at the moment because you're not in all the moments, but you still see things. But then you think about it and you talk to him as a great grandfather. You just get to see him each each generation. You see a little less. You're a little less important in their life. But you're well, I shouldn't say less important. You're still important, very important in their life. But you have less influence because you're not that big, big a part of their life as each generation goes on. But if they come to you for advice, that's, that's that's the time. See, that's when you get the stage. Then you have to think about what's, you know, I have great granddaughters. I have a great granddaughter that just went out for hockey to learn how to how to ice skate. And she wants to play hockey, but she also likes the ballet. So she, she has a tutu. So she wore a tutu to, to uh, hockey practice at five years old. <laughs> I've got a picture of that. But you got to understand that. That's uh What's important in her world? So when you offer advice to some uh, great grandchild, it's something you got to think about a little bit because it's not all the way we grew up or the way the next generation grew up. I'm talking to, to a span of three to four generations there of time. You know, there's been 60 years passed since I was or 70 years passed since I was her age. So when I offer some influence... I, I thought about it at first. I was appalled. I thought she wears a tutu to hockey practice. She's going to get her head knocked off. And I thought, wait a minute. She's five years old. <laughs> Take the things into consideration. And I thought, you know, instead of trying to talk her out of it, I, she needs to do that. You know. So we now have the pictures of her doing it. But see, that's an example of your first reaction is say, oh, she, honey, don't wear a tutu. To, you know, you're going to get your head knocked off. <laughs> but instead... The other kids liked it. See, I was taking what would have happened in my time 70 years ago and trying to plug it into her time. And that doesn't fit because the kids are different today. Kids are kids are still kids and they're very into the world around them. But there's not the hardcore, you don't hit each other over the head quite as often, hopefully. And uh, there's a little more understanding and a little more intellect. There's a little more thought. And so she wore to 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 hockey practice and did quite well. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, it's great stuff, and I I got a long way to go, but I love to hear. Uh, I've never heard a bad word about becoming the grandfather, becoming the great grandfather. So I'm in no hurry to get there, but uh, awesome to hear the stories. And again. Uh, head on Larry Zonka. The link is in the description of this podcast episode. Book doing very well. Grab it over on Amazon. Obviously, Larry, you had a legendary NFL career, Hall of Famer, uh, Super Bowl MVP. We know the whole bit. Uh, your legacy is secure in the world of football. What would you say you want your legacy to be as a father? A good listener. I would, uh, I would like the fact that there's good communication. It seems like 
There was great communication the first generation and pretty good the second. And hopefully it'll be good in the third and perhaps even the fourth if I'm lucky enough. But uh, I think being able to talk with the kids and not not pre-decide based on what you've learned in your life because life changes to be understanding. And you and I both know, even with the first generation children or the second generation children, a place where the kids are confident they can go and present their situation, present their problem, and not have to be honed in with the necessary disciplines, but someone that will understand and listen and actually try to help in a positive way. I think uh, if there's one thing I would like to see carry on to my my sons and daughters that carry on to their grandchildren is the fact that the kids will always come to us and talk and want to get an honest opinion and you can deal with them honestly that way. In other words, a, a, an interested ear to listen before they go back out and make the decision that's going to affect the rest of their life. I think that uh, having that confidence from generation to generation is a show of respect and admiration that goes on. That's a two-way street from generation to generation. And I hope that's in my family. I think it's in the family, some more than others, but everything's always different. You have to play it by ear. And uh, I wish it got easier as it gets as you get older, but actually it gets a little more complicated because you have to think about you know, what was normal when I was a kid for a kid to reach his discipline may, is not at all four generations later. So you have to think about that before you offer advice, because otherwise your ad advice is, and, and is uh, coming from antiquity, and it doesn't help. Uh, uh, very well said, Larry. And, and obviously, uh, you have the book out right now. What, what, what is what is next for you? Do you have any other kind of projects you're working on? And what and, and, and I have you here? What are your thoughts on the game of the NFL today while we're doing that? <laughs> well, the game has changed greatly, and it would be easy for me to sit here and say, "Well, you got to be a, you had to be a lot tougher to play the game when I played." Well, that's not necessarily true. The game has changed. It was a little more brutal and a little more physical, uh, perhaps when we played it. But the kids are bigger, faster, and stronger today than what we were, so it's probably just as physical. But the great thing about it, and I'll, I'll give you this one major point, and then I'll, I'll stop addressing the whole issue. There's one great, great point. When I played the game, if you got more than two scores ahead, if you got 14 points ahead by halftime, all you had to do was work on burning up the clock and run the game out. The other team couldn't come back. In other words, uh, if you got more than 14 points in the first half, you had to really fall down and go blind in the second half to, to lose the game. But today, the ability of these receivers and the way the rules have changed around the passing game, uh, you can be three touchdowns ahead at halftime. And if you put your helmet up and put your ball cap on at halftime, it's kind of laughing and joking, go back out there. It'll turn around and you'll lose the game because it, they can score that fast and come back. So even though you've outsmarted them in the first half or outmuscled them or whatever you've done and scored 21 points, you better have your hat on and be ready in the second half because in this game today, they can come back, not only tie you, but be, defeat you in the second half. So it's changed a great deal. And what's how's that translate to a fan? If you and I are sitting in the, in the stands, that translates as the excitement so when you see a guy raise it to throw it and there's a guy downfield, everybody understands what's happening. Back when I played to organize the running game, you had to read people's quarter second movements and so on. Well, the people in the stands, the running game is kind of boring from what from a spectator standpoint. So I think the game today is more exciting for the spectators who understand when they see a guy throw it and they see another guy catch it. They don't understand the intricacies of the running game and how milliseconds, and you can't see that from the stand. So uh, I think the game is uh, more rewarding for the fans today. It was probably more rewarding for the players back when we was in the physical aspect. But that's the way things change, but it's a spectator sport. So I think it's changed. If you ask me if that's good or bad, I would say it was good. Sure, I miss the way we played in the more physical game, and the, the, the rules were are greatly great a lot broader but it's more refined today and it's more exacting and it's made the game more competitive and i think that's good for the fans and i think it's good for the kids that grow up and watch it it makes it exciting 
Yeah, very cool. And I and and I and I first part of that question there. What what kind of what are you working now that the book is out and you're doing all that? What do you got next? You're working on any other kind of projects? What's next for you? I spent 25 years in Alaska with my wife Audrey, and we did a show north to Alaska that was broadcast on TV for some 15, 17 years of that 25. I would like to go back and write a book about discovering all the different parts of Alaska. I was mesmerized by Alaska when I first read a book about it in Mr. Saldis's principal's office. And I was more excited about Alaska than I ever was about football. But I could never get there. Finally, after football, I got there. And Audrey and I ran the TV show. And we visited, because of doing the TV show, we visited some of the most remote places. And here's that's the one thing I want to impress upon you if you if you have a draw to alaska because it's out back and it's wild trust me when i tell you i've been there i go back every year for two or three, you know two or three weeks or perhaps a month or month and a half i go back up there there are parts of alaska that are still so remote if you want to get a flavor of what the frontier was back in the time of uh, davy crockett uh <laughs> someone like that you can still do that because there are parts of alaska that are still so remote that few people have walked on them all right so to get there you know obviously there's parts of alaska that are very civilized down in the southwest and southeast parts of alaska and you can get there and travel fly right in but then you get to the remote places where the bears still walk up and look at you you know, I'm not making an exaggeration here. I'm telling you, I've been there. I've done this. And it's like uh, it's like reading about what Davy Crockett or Daniel Boone did and then going out and standing there and realizing that you're standing where you're standing. Few men, few women have ever walked on that trail before. It's a bear trail. And maybe two or three people have crossed that over the eons. But you're so remote. <laughs> I, there's something that just uh, that, that really lights my uh, uh, candle on fire to be up there and do that. And I was fortunate enough to go do that. Now, when you ask me what I'm going to do, I'm going to write another book about what it was like to go there and stand under the northern lights and see them, the northern lights hit the ground in front of you and, and move down the, to, over to the river and so on. That is the most rewarding thing as far as being a human and being here on this planet or whatever short period I am to see that. Uh, well, it's just a touch with uh, something bigger. Yeah, very cool. I know I did an interview with a retired Navy SEAL, uh, Jeff Reed, who uh, is up in Alaska. He's doing the thing with raising the dogs, I guess, get for an Iditarod type deal. Yeah. Uh, but he's, he's embedded there, loves it, talked all about it, same uh, uh, same way. So uh, I, I always hear, uh, you know, great. I know they do the cruises that go up that way and the whole bit. So. Um, all right, Larry, I've kept you here again. Larry Zonka, head on link in the, the book is linked to the book is in the description of today's podcast episode. Last thing I want to hit you with here. I love to ask all the dads that I get on the podcast. What type of advice do you have for that new dad or for that about to be father who's out there listening? Well, react less emotionally and put a little thought into it. Uh, you know, it's uh, I think that's consistent with what my grandfather told me years ago when I asked him about what it's like to be, you know, I asked him a lot of things. Granddad used to, when he was in his late sixties, used to sit down in the, in the front yard on our farm and, and holler real loud as he got down because he had arthritis. And I, I when I was six, five or six years old, I walked up to him and said, Granddad, why do you always holler when you get down on the ground? And he took me by both shoulders and looked me right in the face. And he said, you remember this moment because someday you'll know. <laughs> now, when I sit down, I think of granddad, you know, I flash back because he always had good advice. He was always slow. You, you always ask him a question. He would think about it. And then he would give you some philosophical advice instead of a simple yes or no that served a, a discipline purpose. He would think about it in terms of the long longevity of your life. And uh, so grandparents are kind of cool to have, have to have around. Well, very well said. I love the message. This has been an honor for me. I got to say, Larry Zonka, you're a first-class father all the way. And thank you for giving me a few minutes of your time here at First Class Fatherhood. Thank you, Alec. See you.